Welcome everybody. Today is a beautiful day. Um, we're so um, happy that so many of you can join us from wherever you are and uh, for letting us have a little uh, piece of your evening today. Uh, so today, September 7th, is actually California Biodiversity Day. Um, and I can't think of a better way than to spend uh, some time with these wonderfully talented colleagues um, putting together what I think is a true collaboration um, you know, and something um, very exciting that we've been getting a lot of questions about. So for today's program, uh, we have a lot of exciting things for you. So we are going to start off um, just with some brief housekeeping items. Um, really appreciate um, you bearing with us today. Uh -huh. uh, this is our first time using the Microsoft Teams webinar platform. Um, so there might be some tech glitches and thank you for your graciousness as we work through them. Um, if you're having tech problems, uh, we are monitoring our inbox currently, um, so please reach out. Um, they, we will be using uh, the Q&A function, um, and so if you go to the very top bar of your webinar viewer, um, you will see a little thing that says Q&A. That is where you can input your questions and answers. Uh, we will also have the chat function enabled. So those are things more, um, less questions and more comments. So if you have a great resource um, or something that you would like to share with the greater community, um, that is where that should go. Uh, we have colleagues currently monitoring the chat and the Q&A. So I will be your host and facilitator for today. And it is my honor to introduce my colleague, Bill Miller, who will be talking about Bears and Marin. Then uh, my colleague Kiana, who will be talking on coexisting with bears, and then Megan Wall Murphy is going to really bring us home uh, talking about what it really means to be with bears. Um, and we're going to hear about um, some about what it's like to participate in community science around bears from our, um, our um, colleague and friend Peter Barto. And uh, we have almost half an hour allocated to uh, questions and answers because we know there are many. So uh, we hope that you walk out of here with um, your burning questions answered um, and your myths dispelled and um, maybe a different perspective on theirs. So with that, um, as people are trickling in, um, we want to tell you a little bit more about what it is, where at space you're in. So um, this webinar was brought to you by the One Tam Partnership. One Tam is a partnership of the California State Parks, Marin Water, Marin County Parks, and the National Park Service, along with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. Um, together, we focus on uh, many things on Mount Tam and in Marin. Uh, we've been around since 2015-ish, and our work um, involves landscape level um, science and management. Uh, we work on things like communication projects. So this is an emergent topic in our community. And so here we are talking about it. Uh, we have we work on climate adaptive projects. Um, we have youth programs, community science programs. Um, that's one of the things that I run. And we have our whole conservation science and management team also. Um, and again, we're doing this in partnership and together working to have a collective impact on the ecological and social health of uh, Mount Tam and Marin at large. Um, and lastly, we are supported by members. Um, so if this work is inspiring to you, you know, I urge you at the very least to get to stay updated uh, via our newsletter. Um, you can sign up, it's a quarterly newsletter. Uh, it's full of stories and updates from our very broad portfolio of work. Um, ways to get involved, um, you know, a heads up about our youth programs like paid internships that are coming up. Um, we also urge you to look at our calendar uh, where you can see what we're up to, what you might be able to join, you know, over the weekend. Um, and uh, yeah, and we really urge you to become a member and join. Um, there are some cool member benefits and include special events um, and just a really great way to support a place that I think we all love. So with that, um, I am going to welcome Bill Miller into um, to share his slides about bears. Welcome, Bill. Great. Thanks, Lizette, uh, for the great introduction. And uh, hi, I'm Bill Miller, and I work for California State Parks here in the Bay Area District. Um, and so I thought I would start off by 
um, talking to you a little bit about how I got involved with bears here in uh, Marin and Sonoma counties. Um, so let's go ahead and move on from here. Um, in 2013, uh, my wife had the great idea of putting a game camera behind our residence at Sugarloaf Ridge State Park in Sonoma County. Uh, now, that's uh, up in the Sonoma Valley near the town of Kenwood. And lo and behold, we got a bear on our game camera out there. Uh, we didn't think nothing of it. We had lived in places where there was bear before, and we thought, oh, you know, Sonoma County, they have bear here. Um, no one's going to think anything of it. Well, when I shared it with others, people got excited because as it has turned out that people hadn't really seen bear um, in Sonoma Valley um, uh, in the last 10 years. And it turned out that other people had seen sign of bear um, at about the same time that I did. Uh, long story short, that prompted some of us to have a meeting about bears and their presence in Sonoma and Marin counties. And what we realized was that, you know, maybe we should try to get ahead of the game and start talking about what does it mean to live with bears in our counties. And uh, one of the concepts that we had thrown out quite a bit then was this idea of a bear culture that is a, a, a culture of promoting an understanding of bears and living with bears and an appreciation for them. Um, so one of the things I did at that time, because I was interested in, in um, the history of bears in, in our counties, I just, you know, did a Google search the news and uh, looked for various bear sightings. One of the earliest stories I could find was uh, of a bear in Glen Ellen, uh, I believe that had uh, actually climbed up a tree outside of a, a bed and breakfast there. Um, and then there was a, an early sighting of bears at Point Reyes. I think that was at a, um, a youth hostel uh, in 2003. Um, and so it's interesting, you can kind of see through the history here that um, bears kind of show up every six years or 10 years or so um, down in both Marin and Lower Sonoma. Um, and now, of course, if we, um, excuse me here. Um, and then for, for a while there, there was, uh, um this this uh story this idea of a mystery bear running around in in tamales bay and western western marin um but what it seemed like is that that in recent years these um sightings and these stories uh had increased let's see and then moving on um so in starting in 2021 um some of us started to put together uh, a list of uh, sightings of bears. Um, and some of these sightings come from game cameras. Some of these are direct sightings from people. Some of these are sightings of scat or track or sign that um, we can then verify. Um, it can be hard sometimes to verify a uh, sign or scat uh, because there are other things that can look similar. And we also have to um, uh, be aware that in recent years, there's been an increase in the use of cameras, um, both on our phones uh, and security in our doorbells, and also um, in, in the use for research, um, that uh, I think this has contributed to the number of sightings and observations that we've had in recent years. Um, but there's other things going on as well. And this list is not complete, by the way, we're still kind of uh, working on this. So what are some of the other things that are happening here? We know that Black Bear Range is expanding, uh, and these are just various maps that I've pulled out uh, um, from, from various documents through time um, that show some of this range expansion. Uh, on the left here, you can see what um, CDFW drew, or actually probably back then they were fish and game, um, drew as, as the Black Bear habitat. You can see that um, for Marin County, they don't even have anything shaded. Um, and then for Sonoma County, it's just the northern part of the county uh, and then over in the eastern part of uh, Napa. Um, in this uh, middle map here with the yellow and the orange on the green background, they show areas of recent expansion um, for black bears in, this looks like the, uh, the Mayacamas here, 
and over in um, oh, what is this Solano, uh, uh, Yolo, and Calusa counties. Um, the current uh, sort of quote unquote accepted map um, that CDFW uses actually includes most of Marin County and Sonoma counties. So moving on. So the other thing that is happening not only is Black Bear Range expanding. Uh, black bear populations are increasing, and um, I can let Kiana speak more to both the range expansion and and uh, the black bear population increases, but just this is what's happening. The other thing that we can look at when we look at bears across the state um, is that we know that the highest density of bears is just to the north of us uh, in the uh, north coastal ranges, uh, the Klamath and the Cascades. It's the highest density of bears uh, in our state. Uh, and then it's sort of uh, um, uh, the, 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 middle, the middle range for, for density is in the Sierras and the lowest densities are in the uh, Southern California ranges and the, and the transverse range. Now, historically, if we reach far back in time, we had three bear species that were here in Marin. We had the short-faced bear, which existed from about 1.6 million years ago to about 10,000 years ago. So this bear would have coexisted with uh, um, the peoples that were around then, uh, the Clovis peoples and the other prehistoric human, uh, humans that were around at the time. And also we had brown bear and black bear uh, then as well. Brown bear Brown bear evolved somewhere around two and a half million years ago, whereas black bear evolved somewhere around five million years ago. Um, now, of course, we know that in recent history, in the last you know 150 years, both uh, grizzly bear, brown bear, uh, and black bear have been severely restricted in their range. Um, grizzly bear, of course, is no longer found in California, uh, and uh, the black bear range has been severely restricted. So um, this kind of brings me down to then, well, what do we, and I put in parentheses, I, what do I know? Because this is really, this is largely my opinion from learning about bears in the last few years in, in our counties. Um, we live in former bear country. We have good bear hab habitat. Bears show up here occasionally, um, and that we have a, an apparent uptick in sightings, but we also have to temper that knowledge that with the fact that we also have an increase in use of cameras. There are more bears, and we're also pushing more out into places where bears um, what traditionally are. Um, and so I think bears are really just reoccupying the habitat they were pushed out of um, or taking advantage of the the fact that we no longer have grizzly bears in, in much of the, the range. Um, what are some other things that I don't know? I don't really know the effects of wildfire. It can have direct impacts. It can push uh, a species away or it can pull species in depending upon its uh, effect upon both the food and the habitat. Uh, and food is, is really, really key for bears. So how a fire affects food and uh, important habitat like denning and overwintering sites uh, uh, or wintering sites uh, are, is really important. Um, and then something else, I just put it out there because I don't really know this question uh, here. What's the effect of climate change? Um, and it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be dependent on food and, and habitat. So I think with that, that's um, really all that I have in terms of what do we know and don't know about bears? So I will um, see if I can't stop sharing my screen and um, we will leave it at that. Thank you, Bill, for your wonderful overview. Um, and thank you everyone that's been coming in. Um, we are taking questions, so put them in the Q&A. And we are taking um, and we will answer them at the end. I would like now like to um, invite Kiana onto the stage to tell us a bit about her perspective and um, her. Well, I guess the the California Department of Fish and Wildlife perspective rather <laughs> um, on coexisting with bears. Um, so Kiana, 
Uh, really excited to have you here and to hear about your rich experience uh, here in the Bay Area and also uh, in Tahoe. I was just in Tahoe um, and I have to say I was like, wow, I was really impressed by all of the garbage cans. But also like I got a little I thought I was going to see some bears. So, um, you know, I had to just be happy with seeing a taxidermy bear. I promised my one year old daughter that we would see bears and that's the one we saw. And that was good enough for her. So, you know, take what you can. It still counts. <laughs> it still counted. It was, still was great. All right, Kiana, thank you so much. All righty. So hopefully you guys can all see my screen here. Um, and I wanted to say a big thank you to Lizette and the One Tam uh, for putting on this webinar in the first place and bringing everybody together uh, so we can create the best environment to live successfully and responsibly with bears. Um, like it was said, my name is Kiana Hargreaves and I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Tonight, I would like to give you all the tools to reduce conflict with bears and to start preparing for more bears moving into Marin County. I want to explain the department's stance on bears and to make the public aware of what my job is as it's a newer position. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife is responsible for managing California's diverse fish, wildlife, and plant resources and the habitats upon which they depend for their ecological values and their use and enjoyment by the public. So like we said, I am the human wildlife conflict specialist for the entire Bay Delta region. So that is 13 counties that I'm covering right now. Um, I have worked with bears in Tahoe, like was said, and I have, a, have had numerous encounters with bears while I'm working um, throughout California. Garrett Allen is the unit biologist that covers your guys' county, and Stacy Martinelli is the unit biologist conducting the bear study in the North Bay. Garrett and Stacy are in the chat as well, so they can answer any questions that you might have while I'm presenting or at the end. And there is also a PDF in the chat, along with some helpful links and some contact information to get a hold of me if you guys need to. Wildlife biologists can respond to human wildlife conflict incidences, but their main role is to manage wildlife populations, conduct surveys, and monitor for diseases within their counties. Currently, CDFW is conducting an ongoing bear study in the North Bay. Fecal DNA um, has been collected and is being used to estimate the, po the bear population in Napa and Sonoma counties from 2020 through 2022, and that study will expand to include Solano and Marin counties. We will, we will be using satellite collars to track the movements, uh, estimate the home range and the survival and possible den sites um, about bears that we collar. The information gained from these animals will help CDFW find where bears are crossing roads or highways frequently. So we can either put up signage or we can propose wildlife crossings to help them move safely. So what is a human wildlife conflict specialist um, and what do they even do? <laughs> um, so the goal of my job is to help wildlife and humans coexist peacefully. Um, I do this by responding to every single call, email and wildlife incident report that is submitted by the public when they have any type of encounter with an animal. We have a conflict hotline that gets checked daily, except on the weekends currently, um, but we're hoping to fix that. And I respond to injured or distressed wildlife. So example, that's um, most of the time deer stuck in something. Um, and I educate property owners about the animals that they're having issues with, and I provide information about non-lethal deterrence. Uh, I also conduct site visits to properties that are experiencing damage, and I give personalized mitigation strategies specific for that issue. I also issue depredation permits after all non-lethal techniques are used. Um, I give educational talks like this one, so we can reduce the conflict hotspots and continue to have bears. So I chose one of the more outdated maps, like um, unless over the ones that Bill had, um, but bears are continuously moving. Um, so these maps need to constantly be updated. Um, they move 
uh, into areas with consistent food sources. Um, and you guys can help improve this data by reporting incidences or sightings. This is just one of the reasons my position was created. So there would be somebody dedicated in each part of the state to address conflict events. Our goal is to keep wildlife wild, reduce that negative interactions with people and keep animals from depending on human food. So who is even responsible for keeping bears wild? All of us. It's really, really important that we work together so we can keep these bears wild. People who live in or visit bear habitats have a responsibility to the wildlife and to the habitat to keep it pristine. Bears are driven by their sense of smell and will eat as much as they possibly can before hibernation. So some of their eating habits, uh, bears are omnivores, so they will eat anything from like grass to meat. Um, when given the access, black bears will eat human food, pet food, compost, beehives, bird seed, fallen fruit, garbage, and even livestock. As you can see from this photo, uh, bears will do almost anything to get to whatever food source they have smelt. Um, and their sense of smell is seven times better than a dog's. They can detect food from miles away or within structures such, such as vehicles. They are completely motivated, motivated by food. So that is the main attractant that brings bears into conflict with people. So as you can see, this is a chunky bear, um, and it is an example of a bear that has had one too many human-derived meals. Um, when bears depend on human food, they put on more weight than they normally would on their natural diet. Um, this will be influencing their natural behaviors, and in some areas where food is abundant, uh, the urban bears may not hibernate at all, uh, since there is still a continual food source for them to have. Sows, which are female adult bears, will teach their cubs where food is and how to obtain it, even if that meal is from your garbage can. And this just leads into generations of bears that rely on human food, and it increases the likelihood of bear-human conflict. So what even are some of those bear-human conflict situations? Bear-human conflict can be simple, like the bears just knocking over your garbage can, or it can be as extreme as the bear entering your dwelling. CDFW aims to teach residents to do everything they can to keep bears wild and healthy. If the bears are allowed access to our food, they quickly become conditioned to, to us. Uh, when this happens, conflict arises and the bears can cause extensive property damage. Bears addicted to human food lose their fear of humans and be can become aggressive or dangerous, um, and they, they might attack pets or kill livestock. So how are bears becoming addicted? To understand what motivates a bear, we need to acknowledge how incredibly intelligent they are. Generally, bears will start with garbage. It is the easiest food to obtain, and they quickly realize when trash day is, and they will create a routine around that day. So they'll just go up and down the street on trash day and just fill up on garbage. Next, the food source that is high in calories and protein is pet food. Most notably is cat food. Uh, it is a pungent attractant that causes bears to get closer and closer to houses and they get rewarded for being close. Once a bear realizes that that food source is around, they will continue to escalate to get more food. For example, a car that has food left in it is like a big puzzle box toy that you can buy for like your cat or dog. It's the same situation. They, the bears can test the door handles and eventually they will make their way into that car for whatever smelly object that they smelt earlier. The lastly, the bears can even enter your dwellings if they feel comfortable around people. Uh, that is the main thing that we want to stop and we wanna stop it early. Ideally, we wanna stop it before they even get into our trash. Uh, and I really wanna let you guys know that your actions make a huge, huge different difference. So CDFW works to help humans and bears live together, 
We don't want to kill bears, but the department does have a legal obligation to issue depredation permits when one is requested and when the situation warrants. As you can see from the photo, the bear on the left is a very healthy bear. It has good teeth. That's a bear eating what bears should be eating. Now the bear on the right, uh, as you can see, a lot of their teeth are basically disintegrated um, and that's due to them just being in trash cans all day and eating really, really sugary, unhealthy foods. Um, and unfortunately, that bear is an unhealthy bear and eventually is going to starve to death just because it can't chew anything anymore. So how to keep bears wild? You've heard me say this a couple times now. Um, and again, the key is to keeping them out of our food sources. The main thing and the most important thing that I hope you guys take from this whole um, presentation is to keep your trash locked up. So you can either have specialty bear proof trash cans or you can use traditional cans and keep it stored in a locked shed or a garage until the morning of collection day. Um, you can also clean your garbage cans with bleach or ammonia or even set a little bit of the bleach or ammonia on your garbage can at the end of the day or anything like that to just continuously interrupt the bear's sense of smell. Next, we want to bear proof our yards. Again, we don't want to leave any food out there, including pet food or even scented items. Um, a lot of times bears might test what you ever what you have out there, such as suntown lotion. Um, we want to remove bird feeders and clean our barbecue after each use. This might sound excessive, but bears again have a really great sense of smell and they will go after just the scraps that are left on the grill after each use. Uh, you can install motion activated sprinklers or lights or alarms um, and we just want a quick change in the environment to scare that bear away from us. We don't want them to have any good interactions on our own property. And to bear proof your home. I don't foresee us having this issue, but just in case we want to keep our doors and windows locked and don't leave food out on the counters. Uh, we want to block off crawl spaces um, that could be potential den sites for bears. So that can be anything like underneath decks, around the perimeter of your house, or any semi-enclosed space. I brought up CDFW's Wildlife Incident Reporting website, or the WIR system, but I want to explain that a little bit more. You guys can Google Wildlife Incident Report CA, and the very first link that will pop up will be a .gov website. If you click on that, it'll take you to this screen that I have up right now. And on that right hand corner where the circle is, it says report a wildlife incident. When you click on that, it'll ask you for your basic information, where you live, and then a brief description of what sort of thing that you're reporting. This page, um, it'll be the same for any kind of reporting that you do. So that can be sightings, or it can be that you're having some sort of conflict with some sort of wildlife. Once you uh, submit all of that information, a CDFW staff will call or email you to talk about the situation. If it is a sighting, uh, we want to know when, where, if you've seen it again, um, and if you have any photos, that is extremely, extremely valuable to us. Um, so please, if you're safe in a safe place, please take a photo. Um, that'll just help us understand the situation. Um, and ideally, if the bear has like a blaze or something, some sort of significant marking, we can track where they're going just based off of your guys' sightings. To shed some light on CDFW's process for fielding wildlife incident reports, I would like to share some real stories. So a while back, we received a call from the local police department that a healthy bear wandered into downtown. Uh, this one was in Davis, but it could eventually happen in Marin. Um, this was classified as a no harm, no foul bear. And as it has done nothing, it was just there, it was just moving along, and it just needs to be redirected back into wild spaces. CDFW staff responded by hazing that bear to move it along on its own. Hazing can include things like paintballing the bear to direct where it runs or something that discourages the bear from continuing on its current path. 
the goal of hazing is to create a negative association with people and their property. If the bear does not leave and there is no easy way for it to return to the wild, CDFW staff might chemically immobilize it after all other efforts have been exhausted. If we do do that, we would move it to the closest available habitat. We want to haze bears to create a sense of fear of humans so they do not turn into habituated bears that would cause problems. So a new situation. I receive a call that a bear had been knocking over garbage cans for a couple of weeks now, and the home homeowner was just tired of picking up that trash. Um, the bear didn't cause any property damage at this point. It was more so just a nuisance but it was relying on food in the garbage cans as a consistent food source, and we wanna break that cycle. In this case, I advise the homeowner to keep his gar garbage can in the garage until the morning of pickup. I also suggested cleaning the garbage with bleach and that other stuff that we talked about on the previous slides. I also wanted him to relay the information to his neighbors so everybody can follow that advice. With sites such as Nextdoor, it's really, really great to give the same information to a broad group of people. Um, it's important that everybody in the community is following these practices to ensure that bears don't move from one neighborhood to the next. Now the most complicated type of situation. A wildlife incident report was submitted that stated a bear ripped open a chicken coop and ate half of the chickens. The homeowner requested a depredation permit, so I conducted a site visit where I checked what kind of deterrence they had in place to protect their animals. I took notes and photos of all of the damage and then submitted all of this information to my supervisor and then two more supervisors above him. All supervisors agreed that the property owner had extensive damage and that a depredation permit was warranted. In this permit, I explicitly explained what other mitigation measures must be taken to protect his animals. Homeowners must complete hazing, mitigation practices, and take steps to reinforce and protect their property before a permit can be issued. This permit allows the permittee or a designee, most of the time a USDA federal chapter, to euthanize that problem bear. This is the very, very last step and one that is not taken lightly by CDFW. It usually occurs when all other efforts to deter the bear have not worked and or the bear has significantly damaged property, pets or livestock. We want to stop the bears when they're getting in the garbage before it leads to anything that would come close to a depredation bear. One of the main questions I'm asked is, can you just move the bear somewhere else? <laughs> um, and unfortunately, the answer is almost always no. Uh, once conditioned to human food, bears cannot successfully be relocated. This just moves the problem somewhere else. Uh, bears regularly return to the same property or another one right next door where they continue their destructive behavior. Bears are also territorial. So if we move one bear into another territory, one of them could be killed by the other. Bears will also travel long distances to return to their homes, and this includes crossing busy streets and highways. This can cause the bear to get hit by a car or starve trying to get back home. So relocation is not a good um, end all thing. Relocation is a, is a last resort. Um, so for the no harm, no foul bear, we can do it, but it's something that we try hard to avoid. We don't want to chemically immobilize animals. So if you guys see anything, say something. So feeding wildlife is illegal. If you see or you suspect somebody intentionally feeding bears and bringing them into our communities and causing that negative interaction, you guys can call Caltip um, at the number here, and I think it's also in the chat. And with that, if you have any questions for CDFW, here are some resources to reach me. And I think these are also in the chat for you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really informative. And uh, we are getting a lot of really great questions about garbage cans in the chat. We will address those um, in our Q&A. 
Um, and, um, you know, for our next speaker, uh, we have Megan. I'm going to do a brief intermission right now as she gets set up to um, invite some other colleagues that are going to help out with the Q and A. So, Megan, I'm going to um, I'm going to go ahead and share your slides and let you get started. So let's do the thing. Do the thing. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Great. Can you hear me, Lisette? Just to make sure. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks so much for taking the time this evening. I know we all have a lot of busy lives and things, but um, I really appreciate your willingness to learn about this kind of non-human world we get to share. Um, my name is Megan Walla Murphy, and I have been working in conservation for over 20 years and I have been tracking animals really um, diligently and sometimes in the old school way of following from sign and footprints to collaring and uh, GIS and telemetry stuff. But um, this talk is really going to be about the relationship that I have built with bears and understanding, you know, what does it mean to live in a place with bears and how Bill kind of chatted about, um, you know, building a bear culture. Next slide. I always like to start with giving thanks to my teachers because there's a long legacy behind all of us um, that are on this call of how we got to be where we are. And certainly um, you'll see the bears are top center for me. They are one of my greatest teachers, um, as are the plants and the water and the animals. And I just also want to give thanks to all of the colleagues that are on um, this call and this panel. I've worked with many of you individually and learned so much from all of them. And in this kind of reality of this bare tidal wave that we get to experience, um, we get to work collectively. So thank you to all of you. Next slide. So I often get questioned, why bears? Like, what's the deal? Why do we care about bears? And why have I spent, you know, literally 25 years of my life tracking bears and really learning about them. And I'll tell you, um, one of the things that really hooked me was when I think I was, you know, mid 20s and I was in the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts and this um, kind of older elderly couple came and they had been living with bears for, you know, their whole lives. And they're like, Megan, we got to show you this thing. So they take me out to what they were calling an ancestral trail. They're sometimes called traditional trails or step-by-step -step trails. Um, and there in the duff in these mountains were bear footprints that were literally like six inches deep. And I was like, what is going on? And these bears would walk. And then at every tree, when I was following this trail, the trees were slashed and then there was a turn. And then the trail would keep going and then another tree and a slash from their claws and the trail would turn again and I was like it was mesmerizing to me and so I started learning more and more about these ancestral or step-by-step -step trails um, and really what I found is no one knows what's going on but bears have been caught on video walking in these step-by-step -step trails and what they've seen is if a big bear comes into one of these trails um, he or she will shorten their stride to make sure they're stepping in all of the footprints of the bears that have gone before. And if it's a little bear, they lengthen their strides to step in the footprints of, who knows, maybe their ancestors. Um, and it's also been recorded that mama bears will teach their cubs about these trails. So kind of fast forward over the next 20 years, um, I've had a lot of time in bear country and I come on these trails every now and then. And if you can imagine when you go into um, an art museum and there's a beautiful piece of art in front of you and maybe there's a hush that comes over you or you're um, near an old growth redwood or you're in a sacred temple and there's this quiet that comes on. When I find these trails, it's often what um, it feels like. There's something more going on than just footprints in dirt. Although footprints in dirt are cool, I like them. So all of a sudden when I first saw this step-by-step um, -step trail in Massachusetts, I was like, 
what is going on with you bears? And, and I was completely hooked. And my journey with bears is huge and broad and continues to go. Next slide. So bears and humans um, have a long, long existence. Um, what I have discovered in my history, more than just ecology and biology of bears, which I've gone into, is the social interaction and social um, relationship that bears and humans have had. Pretty much, if you have ancestors from in the Northern Hemisphere, it's likely that you and somewhere in your lineage was living with bears. And that just blows me away in the Northern Hemisphere. And so as I started to kind of go into my own research, next slide, please. Um, I was realizing that almost all the cultures, no matter, depending on how far you go back, you learn that people um, believe that animals were teaching them, specifically bears were teaching them. I've had the great privilege of working with lots of our California native tribes, and I'll get into that in a little bit, learning about bears from them. Um, but in California and certainly in um, North America, what we now call North America, there's a long legacy of bears teaching humans the foods that we get to eat um, and the medicines that we eat. So here's a bear digging, um, and I don't know what it was digging for. And then here's a young Yurok woman digging for OSHA. So OSHA is also called bear root. Um, and it was it's a really, really great medicine for colds and coughs and um, bringing up things that are in your lungs and bears eat it as well. So um, there's this beautiful intertwining of bears and humans. Next slide, please. Also, as I keep going in my history and reading about um, relationships with bears, you know, we can talk about a lot of our language comes from bears. That sound, er, um, ursus, meaning bear, ursa, um, or even the word bear or barren or to B-A-R-E, um, all stems from the relationship and the sound that bears make. There's a really great book called The Sacred Paw. Um, the whole first chapter is about how um, many, many languages around the Northern Hemisphere stem from their relationship with bears. But also, um, there's a belief that bears not only lived on the surface of the earth, and we know they den and go under the earth, but they are also in the sky. So they had um, these, you know, kind of bridge-like relationships with, you know, the above, the middle, and the below. Next slide. And everywhere that I have been able to research where bears have lived, there is a long legacy um, and tradition of bear celebrations, dances, initiations. Um, Ireland and England, this is a painting from, I believe it was in England, made many, many years ago. Um, next slide, please. But all across North America, there is a deep um, relationship with bear dancing and bear celebration, bear initiations and rites. On our left um, is a bronze statue of, oops, of the um, Chumash bear dance, which I've been invited to down where I grew up. I grew up in Southern California in those transverse mountain ranges. Um, and it is an astonishing thing to be in a bear dance. The middle pictures from the Haida of the Northwest to also wearing big bear masks and the bear dances there. The polar bears were danced for. Um, this is Inuit tradition. So all around North America, there's um, a lot of fun and relationship. Bears were known as healers. They were known as the rebirthers. They would go in in winter and come out um, in spring. And not only would they come out in spring, um, to live again, they came out with cubs. So there's this whole rebirth thing going on. Next slide, please. The Ainu, um, the ancestral people in Japan had a deep relationship with bears um, where it involved actually going out and hunting the bears in the coldest season of the year. And then that bear became the honorary guest. Um, and sometimes what I have come to learn and know from other people who also currently hunt bears is that you know, you didn't always win. Sometimes you came home with the guest and sometimes the guest got you. And so um, it wasn't taken for granted that humans were the top of the food chain. The bears were extraordinarily powerful. Next slide. 
and I just like to throw this in as well, because this was a tradition around the world. Um, this happens to come from Korea, but that the bears um, and humans were shape shifting all the time, and that the great bear mother was actually um, the birthing of all humans in the northern hemisphere. Next slide, and certainly in Korea. So yeah, and how fun and lucky are we that we get to live with bears? I'm just so thrilled um, that I get to be part of this movement of living with bears again. When I you know, moved to California when I was three years old, there weren't so many bears in Southern California and they're coming in now. And certainly even in my time in Sonoma County in the last you know, 15 years, um, they are increasing. So what we have right now, as Bill was talking about, is we have the Ursus Americanus, which is our black bear. And all of these pictures, except the top left photo, is our black bear. In the top left photo is our grizzly bear with two cuds. And you can see um, that big hump on her back, you know, up towards her shoulder blades, and that kind of grizzled, which is why they get their name, coat with the white. Next slide, please. So California was a land of grizzlies. Um, Sonoma, Napa, a lot of Marin County was actually predominantly grizzly country. Um, grizzlies are of open space and grasslands and oak woodlands. Black bears are creatures of the forest. Um, next slide, please. But, you know, it was 1924, so we're looking at 100 years, the last grizzly known um, was shot and extirpated from California. And there's, we don't have the time right now, but there's a really interesting history and legacy that comes um, from that, you know, extirpation of grizzlies, which are now extinct in California, except, next slide, where we see them on our state flag. And it's kind of ironic, but I love that the black bears are coming back. And who knows, maybe someday in my time, like the wolves and uh, some of our other critters, the condors and such that are getting to rewild California, we'll get to see grizzlies again. Next slide. You've seen this before. Um, I have a couple of the same maps. It's good to know that um, all of us working together have one mind. So this is taken from CDFW. It's just showing, um, you know, from 1992 to 2016, a pretty steady trend of increasing black bear populations in California. It's estimated to have between 30 and 40,000 black bears in California. Um, and as Bill was showing in his map, um, you know, Mendocino, Humboldt counties up in that area, some of the highest black bear densities in California. Uh, you've seen this map too, bears are on the move. Um, and this was taken from 2000, next slide. And here's kind of their most current range. Um, we do see that, you know, Point Reyes is excluded from there, but just the other couple of weeks ago, I went and picked up some bear scat in Point Reyes. So you can extend those hatch marks in Marin County over there. Um, next slide. I just really appreciate this quote. So I am right now, I'm standing in the town of Occidental where I live, uh, the intersection of where Coast Miwok and um, Kashaya and Northern Pomo folks lived. And what I love is that we're in an area now, though predominantly grizzly, the black bears are colonizing. And it's time for us to remember, you know, that they are part of our ecosystem and we are part of their ecosystem. And they, as, you know, um, Kiana was sharing, they're not really differentiating what food is good for them or not, like fridges, freezers, trash cans, that's food to them. And so, how do we um, understand and not continue to fragment ourselves from the larger biology that's working? Go ahead, next slide. Thanks. So as bear sightings are becoming the norm, um, and this is really, as Bill was showing, um, has increased since 2013. And when I first moved up here in 2012, it was big news to get a bear um, and a camera or things. And they are pretty much everywhere. I get Email, several emails a week talking about bear scat, bear sightings, bears on cameras. Next slide. And because they are kind of the norm, um, as Bill was talking about, in 2016, a group of us got together um, and Breck Parkin, who at the time was the California State Archaeologist, he asked, like, how do we bring back a bear culture in the North Bay? 
Um, and that question has led us to the origin of the North Bay Bear Collaborative, which many of the folks who are on this call are members of this. And we are, we're not a nonprofit. We're not a legal organization. We are a bunch of people who got together and we're like, huh, here come bears. <laughs> and here are a lot of humans. What are we going to do? And how do we... Um, kind of make it normative that we live with bears and that you don't put your trash out early. You do um, have guard dogs if you have livestock. You do use electric fences for your orchards, things like that. Um, and also to realize what a gift it is to live with these predators um, who are such an integral part of our ecosystem and ecosystem health. Next slide. So this is just a quick snapshot of the many partners that um, are part of MBBC, the North Bay Bear Collaborative. We have dozens and dozens of volunteers. Um, it's really important. We have uh, three different tribal representatives, which is really, you know, I feel lucky that we get to learn from their perspective. CIMCC is the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center. Um, we're looking with a lot of agencies, universities, nonprofits, a lot of private landowners. Um, bears love grapes. <laughs> There's lots of really fun stories to share about grapes. In fact, I was just up at Jackson Family Vineyard doing um, a scat transect. And what I appreciate is the vineyard owners there like, yeah, well, the bears come in, but we, you know, we're pretty chill about it. We feel like it's our neighbor tax. Um, but what is so interesting to me and kind of lovely is that those bears only hit the most expensive grapes, the bottles of wine that they sell for like $450. Um, it's also been known that they pref bears prefer Pinot Noir over other kinds of grape varietals. So I find that just so interesting. We're also working um, with different ranchers uh, to get the livestock perspective. So having everyone at the table is essential for us. Next slide. So we do that through sharing stories. Um, who doesn't like a good bear story? We have um, a couple of research projects going on. We're doing just on the ground tracking um, and we also have a mapping project. So um, as Kiana was saying, you know, when we get calls about bears or someone's like, oh, I got a bear scatter. Oh, here's a photo of a bear. Oh, here's a track. Um, this all go on a plot of the map. We have the date, the time. Uh, we have amazing people working at Pepperwood right now, kind of doing their magical statistical analysis, um, which I'm so thankful for those folks, and helping us to see trends like where are the bears at what time of year, during what time of day, which will really help us with um, human-bear relationships. And there's a lot of education that goes into living with bears. Next slide. We have um, two different three, well, we're in year three of um, our tribal youth bear projects. We have grants with the Kashaya Pomo Band of Indians and also with the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center. Uh, what I'm really, really chuffed about is we started and we had about three to four kids the first year. And this year we had 16 in one program and 12 in the other. Um, in this project, the youth are learning not just about bears, but really learning about the habitat of bears, um, what their foods are. We're looking at how to be good stewards of habitat to keep a lot of wild food in wild places so that the bears have plenty to eat away from humans. They're learning how to set up wildlife cameras. Um, and then a huge component of this project is to bring the tribal elders in to teach the youth about bear culture. So they're learning about even uh, weaving baskets with bear patterns. They're learning the old bear stories. Uh, and then they go and they're recording the elders telling these stories. So it's, you know, getting paid forward for sure. And part of our, you know, mission of the Bear Collaborative is to make sure that we have youth and people behind us. You know, we want our exit strategy so the collaborative and bears and the relationship continue to grow when none of us are sitting at the table. Next slide. We're also looking a lot at bears and fire. Lots of questions there, um, you know, and as Bill so humbly you know, stated, and I completely agree for myself, there's a lot I don't know. Um, and the bear and fire question is a really interesting one. So we have, um, what's really great is that several of our partners and sites, we have data um, pre and post fire 
about bears. So that's exciting with cameras and scat data. We're also walking um, burn sites and looking at how, you know, known uh, bear trees and bear bedding sites, how those are changing pre and post fire. Next slide. Um, we're also collaborating on a project with UC Davis on a DNA project where we're doing scat collection. We started in 2020 um, and that is continuing and we're broadening our collection into Marin County. Bill Miller is leading, I believe, three or four transects in Marin County. We also have opportunistic scat, Peter uh, scat collection. Peter Bardo will talk, tell you a little bit about that later. It's super fun. You get to go walk around all day um, and track bears. <laughs> it's kind of my dream. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about track and sign. Like, how do you know if it's been a bear and not a coyote or something like that? Next slide. So here's what a barefoot looks like. This is grizzly barefoot. Um, I don't have any black bear feet. I should get myself some. So, um, but their bear, their foot structure is pretty much the same. So if you're uh, sitting out there right now, what I'd love for you to do is just kind of wiggle your toes around. Just put all your consciousness in your feet for right now. And now wiggle your big toe. And now imagine if you were to take your big toe and put it to the outside of your foot. That's where a bear's big toe is. So their big toes are on the outside of their foot. So if you happen to see their tracks, next slide. Um, you can start to be like, oh, it looks like a human foot, but it's a little backwards. So bear tracks, they have um, five toes and they have that really lovely kidney shaped um, pad, which is kind of, if you kind of check out your own hand, you have your fingers and then you have those bones and knuckles, the metatarsals in there. Um, that's what makes the kidney shape of a bear. So these are front feet and also sometimes hind feet will show that kidney shape or sometimes it will come all the way down and look like um, a human footprint. Next slide. So um, as Kiana was saying, bears love to eat. And, you know, we in the North Bay are a foodie culture. <laughs> we have like, and bears are like, oh, we landed in the right place. Um, we have compost, we have beehives, we have orchards, we have livestock, we have all kinds of delicious things. And bears are led by their noses. So where the food is, is likely where you're gonna find the bears, which is why it's so important for um, a bear not to identify your place and your residence's food. Um, they, and it's also really helpful for us if we are tracking bears to know um, what food is in season when. So you can see that top left scat, it's filled with grass. People are blown away in spring. Um, bears just munch on grass. They're like lawnmowers, they're, it's phenomenal. And they're actually choosy lawnmowers. They, all those green forbs, they choose what they want. Um, the bottom is a pin cherry scat. I think that's actually from Southern California that I took that picture. Um, next slide. So bears also will eat and eat and eat um, until you know it has nowhere to go. So these are pictures of a young dispersing bear. This bear was, if you're familiar at all with Santa Rosa, was walking down Stony Point South and hooked it right on um, the Santa Rosa Creek Trail. And this, you know, we presume we saw pictures of it. We didn't. Um, collar it or do a DNA project, but we presume it was a juvenile dispersing bear. And it was uh, end of May, early June, and you know those plums that come out and they're kind of green yellow when they're not ripe and then they turn this beautiful yellow red. Well, this poor bear was just eating so many green yellow plums and just came out as you see it. Um, so there's a lot of food and seed identification that we also do with bear scat. Who knew that you're gonna learn so much about poop today? Next slide. Um, so bears use their scat a lot also as communication in some areas. We learn a lot, but they are, you know, kind of back to that mystery and why bears. They have, um, I, I want to say lexicon, but not verbal lexicon of communication. Um, they love to mark and scent things all over the place. So this is um, my friend Preston is the gentleman in the back and he is a bear biologist. And Jenny Fifield, who's one of our um, just most incredible um, 
volunteers that we have. I'm so thankful for Jenny. And here we are out in the northern Mayacamas, and this is a sergeant cypress. So a bear will stand up on its hind legs and break the tops off of saplings or even bite the tops off of saplings um, as a mark. One of the cool things that we're learning, um, you know, whether black bears were here in the abundance that they are now, or if they're just colonizing for the first time, we get to learn a lot about behavior and in an area that we didn't know about them. And one of the things that we're finding is that they seem to be targeting, if they are there, Sergeant Cypress, because if you've ever smelled a Sergeant Cypress, it's just got this incredible aroma. So bears um, like to eat, they're led by their bellies, but their bellies are led by their noses. And so they're mapping the world through their nose, this kind of aromatic, odorific, if that's even a word, um, scent map of their place. And so they will target um, plants in areas that leave off a lot of aroma. Next slide. Uh, you can also see this was a different sergeant cypress and, you know, miles and miles away. And um, not only will they bite the tops off the uh, these trees, they will claw them and they love you. Once they've like broken the branches, you can see the hair that's on that picture on the right. Um, you know, bears are pleasure seekers. They really, they like to play. They're so fun that way. Um, and they like to scratch and massage themselves. I've seen them do it over and over again. Um, and those knobs are just a perfect back scratch for a really heavy coat. And they're also leaving scent and um, communication that way. Next slide. So I talked about that they'll bite the tops off of saplings, but they'll also come up to a fairly large tree um, with their back. And I'm not sure if you guys can see me or not, but if you can imagine there being a tree or a pole behind your back, the bear will wrap their arms um, behind them and grab the tree and they'll turn their head and they bite the tree and they pull out a hunk. So these are not claw marks that you're seeing. These are actual bear bites. And again, you're leaving saliva, but there's visual cues and stimulation. Um, often they will, you know, target trees that leave a color difference, um, you know, from when they bit to when. So not so when they from when they bit to prior. So they're using odor. They're using scent. Next slide. Um, and they love trees. So black bears, as I said, are creatures of trees. Um, grizzlies were open playing, grassland, oak woodland kind of creatures. Black bears, um, from the time that they are tiny, 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 are part of the tree forest system. So we don't have the time tonight to go into their kind of ecology and um, life cycles. But basically, when a mama bear comes out of the den, and she's got these two little cubs that she gave birth to while she was in the den, um, and not only while she's in the den is she not eating, um, she's nursing. And so when she comes out of the den, she is hungry. But then she's got these little baby fur balls that are pretty helpless and super cute and probably tasty because they seem to be on everybody's menu. I know that sounds cruel, but it's true. And so in order for her to replenish her calories and to get enough food in there um, and not have put her little ones in danger, she uses the trees. And um, I have seen this happen. It just blew my mind. I'd heard about it first, but when I saw it, it was amazing. So what she'll do um, in this case, it was amazing. She actually hit the bottom of the tree, made this kind of slapping noise, and up the cubs went. And they just hung out on the top of these um, trees. What we're finding, at least in Sonoma and Napa counties, is the black bears are preferring old growth dug fur. Um, really interesting. So there'll be big beds and then the mom will slap the tree. The cubs go up these big dug furs or and some other kind of conifer. They hang out there. She goes and eats while the, her little ones are safe in the tree. When she's full or she has a sense that they're hungry or maybe they even start to cry, she'll come back and she'll either call for them or again, she'll make a noise on the bottom of the tree and down come the little bear cubs um, and they're reunited and she'll nurse at that time. So the relationship of bears, their ecology, and humans just is so intricate. I just love it. Next slide. So we're going to wrap it up um, and kind of go to a Q&A. But one of the things, um, this is Skyler. He has now been in our Tribal Bear Youth Project for two years now. And he's I think he's about to be a senior or is a senior in high school. 
Um, one of the things that he's pretty adamant about is how do we share this information? How do we get it out there? Um, because it really is going to take all of us dispersing the information primarily to keep the bears safe and then to keep humans safe as well and our property safe. So please share what you learned. Next slide. Thank you. Um, you can, this is our website, the North Bay Bear Collaborative, Being With Bears. Please look us up. We have um, different events going on and we also are really happy to have volunteers. We have lots of different projects. And um, if you wanna connect directly or have questions, there's uh, my website, you can contact me through there. And I'm about to turn it over to Peter, but Peter and Sharon um, have been our wonderful volunteers and representatives in Marin County. So go ahead, Peter. And thank you, whoever was dealing with my slides. All right. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, we are, we have 20 minutes remaining on the clock. Um, and so, and maybe could you give us the elevator pitch of how we can get involved and what, you know, tell us, you know, go bear team. You, you got it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, what, three words, opportunistic scat collection. That's what it's all about. Um, yeah, I'm Peter. I grew up here in Marin and have been a long time field research volunteer for the River Art Ecology Project. I joined the North Bay Bear Collaborative uh, a few years ago and, and now really into bears. Um, and it's really been fun to see a, an animal that has not been around here for a long time, a uh, long, long time, uh, come back. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough to get some really great footage of two young bears playing near Bon Tempe Lake uh, on one of the River Otter uh, Ecology Project cameras that I maintained uh, last year. So it's been getting very exciting. And as Megan mentioned, uh, <laughs> so uh, my my good friend and amazing naturalist Sharon Barnett and I are kind of the Marin component uh, currently uh, for the MBBC. And one of the things we're tasked with is, you know, hunting down and collecting bear scat, bear sign hair for whatever. Um, and also just being kind of a conduit between the MBBC and Marin residents. Um, so uh, our emails are up there. If you do come across uh, anything, and this happens a lot, uh that we will come and uh you know take a look and uh and try to see if it's something that we can collect for the dna testing or whatever but if nothing else uh, much like bill was saying we're just trying to memorialize all the sightings and visits and whatnot to get a a good idea of uh of whether or not a resident bear population is taking up uh taking up here so uh please reach out to us go to the north bay bear collaborative website you can learn more about the fantastic project that uh, projects that the group's trying to accomplish and uh and yeah contact sharon and i if uh you need a opportunistic scat collection that's going on my linkedin real soon so uh i'll leave it at that and turn it back to lizette Thanks. thank you so much yes really really appreciate that um and you know i just i love talking about poop in my previous life i was a parasitologist and i could just talk about poop all day so um but you know it's it's been a long day um so maybe let's get right to our q a i'm gonna ask our panelists to come on camera um, i know some of you are going to be our chat panelists so we'll keep you in the chat um, so i'm thinking about stacy and garrett and uh, Bill Merkel, you guys can, you know, you guys can be in the chat as we agreed, but our speakers will bring you back on. And um, I am going to go. I know um, some folks are having tech issues with the chat. So uh, please, you can email us at community science, all one big long word, at onetam.org. Um, and we have our operations manager currently monitoring the chat um, and trying to get those questions. If we don't get to your question, uh, we apologize. We have a lot of questions, which is wonderful. And um, and um, but we will um, we are putting together an FAQ resource page, um, and so we will add that to the frequently asked questions. Um, so um, yes, we will go ahead and get started with our Q and A. Um, so let's see. Um, we are going to start with a um, really interesting one that got a lot of staff upvotes. Um, so this is from Ben the Dominic from Novato, and Ben is asking, 
under the assumption that bears entering Marin are from Sonoma and Napa and or Napa, is there any pattern or predicted pattern of migration of uh, migration corridors or migration routes? Like, are they traveling from the coast or inland? Like, how are bears, where are the bears coming from in Marin? And like, what's the story there? Bill, you're Bill, muted. You're muted. <laughs> I'm not sure who wants to take that. I was, I was, I was laughing, I was laughing because, because that's, that's, that's a good that's question. A good question. Um, and Megan, you can chime in here, but I think there's probably primarily two routes. One is through Western Sonoma and Marin, and the other would be down through the Mayacamas, uh, and then you know somehow over across Highway 12 and Highway 1 um, into Marin. Um, I have received a, a photograph of a bear track earlier this year from San Antonio Creek, so just uh, southwest of Petaluma. And of course, we know that last year there was a bear in southwest Petaluma. It was up a tree for like 21 hours, I think. Um, and um, and then, of course, the, the sightings around Novato. So I think that's one potential way. And then, Megan, maybe you can add in, but I've been thinking lately about there's no reason why they can't swim across the river, <laughs> the Petaluma River. Um, and so going through the Petaluma marshes, I think, even though it's pretty open, is a definite possibility. Yeah, but, um, I would agree with you for sure. There's the north, you know, moving north south on the coastal route and then the east west migration. Um, and they're definitely, you know, right on that Sonoma um, Marin County line over by San Antonio. And really, we don't know the answer, but that's why the DNA project is really interesting. It's showing us a lot about dispersal. Oh, this bear was here and now is here this year. Um, and as Kiana was talking about, CDFW um, just got some funding to do collaring, which will also open up our um, knowledge of that. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's always, um, I do a lot of, uh, as I drift off to sleep, I often think about how things are dispersing. And, you know, for me, it's mostly like, I think about how slugs are dispersing. Um, and that's my, that's my person on my personal time, I like to find banana slugs in unlikely places. So you can follow me on INAT. Um, speaking of iNaturalist, um, I am contractually obligated to bring iNaturalist up in every single conversation I have. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, Peter uh, put in a great plug for, um, you know, giving him a, putting up the bat, the, the bear scat signal and calling him in uh, if you find bear scat. But um, is it helpful if folks put their bear sign observations on uh, iNaturalist? Yes, um, we actually mine iNaturalist um, for bear sightings. We also have a project you can join. Um, I think it's the North Bay Bear Collaborative or North Bay Region Project. Um, and we are hoping it's kind of, maybe if anyone there is a tech whiz, we are working on a bear spotter map to go on our website. Cause right now they're kind of filtering through me when people have sightings, but we're you know trying to get a bear spotter map. So you can just put your sightings into our um, website and those will go directly either into INAT or somewhere else. Thank you. Of course. And just uh, for those that are new to iNaturalist, iNaturalist is an online platform. It's an app and also a website uh, where you can submit your observations of all living things. Um, and it's really wonderful because I like to think of how we collectively have, we, we each have like our bear story. Um, and part of me is like, if you have a cool bear story, put it in the chat. Um, but we have our bear story. And then when we put them on the map like this, uh, we're creating creating a collective bear story. And um, and it's just sometimes we don't even know we're doing something special or we witness something special until we kind of put it in the greater context. Um, so um, through One Tam, uh, we offer um, a lot of um, I natural we offer I naturalist training, some bio blitzes, um, and um, you know that is something that we can help you get started with. Um, all right, so yeah, this is the map of of observation so far in Marin County, and 
I think if we got all these eyes, you know, we have uh, we had 250 plus people sign up for this webinar and we have 100 plus people in this room. I think if we all trained our eyes to the ground for Bear Scat, we could make this map more complete. All right. Can I add really quick, if you post a picture of Scat that you think is Bear Scat, it will be very helpful to include a ruler or some sort of uh, scale for reference. Um, there are other scats out there that can be confused for bear scat, um, notably coyote scat or dog scat or even people. Um, <laughs> so it's it can be helpful to include those sorts of things and other details um, if you see any other sign or anything like that. A coin, a water bottle, I, even a hand will help. Um, you know, I know that I knew my my now husband was the one when he sent me a picture of a spider with a coin for scale. And I was just like, yes, that is what I'm talking about in terms of mate selection. So you never know. You never know who's watching you. Hey, Lisa, you're muted. Yes. I, um, all right, so we're going to do our um, our next question. So these are more questions. Um, we're getting a lot of questions to the effect of, um, you know, we don't currently have bear safe um, waste containers um, in Marin County. And so, you know, what's the story with that? Is Marin County at a point where um, that is, you know, universal bear proof canisters are needed? Um, is are we at a point where, um, yeah, like what can people do about waste containers? I think at an individual level, and I appreciate that people are thinking about systemic solutions. So where are we with that? I can speak really quick to what State Parks is potentially doing um, because we've seen this issue uh, of increasing bears, and we also found an opportunity to uh, find funding for it. Uh, we are putting forth a proposal to upgrade all of our uh, food lockers and uh, waste bins in our parks, in the state parks, uh, to bear proof ones. Um, at the moment, I don't believe there, no, there isn't any uh, Marin County specific regulations towards uh, wildlife proof uh, waste bins that I know of, or at least not ones that would be bear resistant. Um, but uh, that may be something that can be thought of it by uh, the local authorities in the future. But um, uh, individuals can always sort of try to take things on their own and work with uh, their local waste management um, uh, um, a provider to uh, get more um, bear proof trash cans. Other things that you can do is just not put out your trash until uh, the, the day of collection. Um, and things like that, and keep it in a secure place until then. Um, and if our colleagues from CDFW have any recommendations or resources, you know, we also uh, will include those in our follow-up materials. Um, in my previous life, I uh, was a resident of the city of Boulder, Colorado, at a time when bears were starting to show up more frequently in the city. And a stopgap measure while the rollout of garbage cans happened was the use of uh, heavy duty bungee cords on, um, on, on ordinary waste containers. Uh, again, not a perfect solution. The bears did figure it out eventually. Um, but while, um, you know, it, it, it kind of it helped with the, that with that a bit. I'm seeing an interesting question also in the chat um, from uh, Lonner Holden here saying, I live in San Rafael. There's a bear residing in my area. Many folks have ripe fruit, apples, pears, grapes at this time of year. Yesterday morning, there was a very fresh bear scat on the fire uh, on the fire road filled with grapes. What is your recommendation in managing one's fruit? And is it a major attractant for the bear's diet? Um, first of all, did you put the scout on INAT and call Peter or Sharon <laughs> and um, or Shannon and um, and um, yeah, secondly, I know um, again, drawing from that example from the city of Boulder, um, there came together a really wonderful grassroots movement um, it's called the Boulder Fruit, Fruit Rescue to pick fruit from neighborhood trees um, and to donate it to food banks. 
and to uh, places that needed it. Um, so, um, you know, again, that was a very creative grassroots solution um, because many of the places we inhabit are former agricultural centers. Again, Megan's right, we have a foodie culture here in the North Bay. Yeah, and the set, um, it's definitely an attractant for sure. So getting food, um, you know, fruit that drops and picking it up and either composting it in proper receptacles or sharing it is really great. There um, are lots of programs of food rescue like we're talking about. Um, other orchard owners, um, during the time that their fruit is ripe, they will bring in guard dogs, which is another really helpful thing. Electric fencing is really a great way to deter. Bears' noses are really sensitive, and as are their bear paws. No, B-A-R-E paws. <laughs> their bear bear paws. Um, so all of those measures are really helpful. And a lot of people love fresh fruit, so share it. So I just got word from our uh, CDFW colleagues that they're having some trouble seeing some of the Q&A. So I'm actually going to uh, read some questions out loud. And if you all from CDFW have answers and you can unmute, um, please do. Or otherwise, you know, you can put it in the chat um, or we'll include it in our follow up material. You muted again. I'm seeing a lot of really great questions about like, what do we do about bears? Um, and um, some CDFW statistics questions about that too. Um, all right, I'm gonna answer a question that I can answer, which is, can um, you recommend a good trail camera? So uh, one of the projects in the one TAM portfolio of community science and conservation work is the Marin Wildlife Watch project, which if any of our legacy volunteers are in this um, webinar, I just want to let you know that we are coming back in October and I'm so excited and I have more. I'll send you more information soon. Um, but in general, uh, trailcam, um, trailcampro.com is a great website. They have a great um, quiz um, that lets you um, narrows down the selection of cameras based on your needs and your budget. Um, and they have great customer service. Um, at one, one TAM, we buy um, hundreds of cameras. So we definitely get lemons and it's um, they are remarkably complicated little uh, pieces of equipment. Um, so it actually is great to have good customer support on um, you know, when something goes wrong with them. Um, and they're a lot of fun. Uh, you'll always, so it's a lot, it's really kind of amazing um, how close we are to nature. All right. All right. Lisa, I just wanted to jump in for a minute because I was looking at some of the questions and I'm going to give a plug. Um, a really great, two great websites are bearwise.org and bearsmart.com. I saw a question about compost um, and they have actually bear proof composting and how you can build your own. They have um, like a 10 page document about electric fencing. Both of those websites are amazing. I believe CDFW um, has is now a Bearwise um, organization, and so really, really great resources. Thank you. Yes, we will be including that in the follow up materials. Um, I'm getting an interesting question from Erin here. Um, citing, I get general um, concerns and fear of bear sightings around Marin. How can I help alleviate concerns and educate them? Um, and one way it's like, well, you tuned in and hopefully, you know, you learned something, uh, you're inspired in some way. So, um, you know, a lot of the research on um, behavior and social change, it's like a lot of um, how we build trust is peer to peer. So, um, you know, you know your people and you connect with them. And so spread the message and build that bear culture. We will also have a recording available. So if you find found a particular, um, you know, this this webinar compelling or a section of it that will be available to share. We'll have those resources available. And um, and I think that is, you know, that is one way to to begin to elevate concerns and educate them. Again, this webinar is a starting point. Um, you know, I think we're all in it for the long haul with the bears uh, in Marin. Um, and I'm curious to, um, you know, Megan is a renowned naturalist and teacher and, you know, Bill inspires so many people. I'm, I'm curious what you what you all think. Um, you know, I've had dozens and dozens of bear encounters and 
the vast majority of the time when a bear comes up to me or sees me unexpectedly, they like jump up, turn around. And like, it's like their feet don't even touch the ground. They're so afraid and they're ready to get away from me. Uh, one of my mentors and when I was working with grizzlies in Yellowstone, he's like, yeah, bears are just scaredy bears. They don't really want anything to do with us. Um, and then what's so funny is they get far away where they feel safe and then they look back to see if you're following them because they're freaked out. So that is really the truth of most bears. They become dangerous um, or challenging even, I wouldn't even say dangerous, but challenging when they become habituated as Kiana was saying. And so um, that's where it really becomes our responsibility to keep those bears um, afraid of humans. Hazing bears, I would say, is totally appropriate. It's great to go out and be like, hey bear, you're, this is not really your place. It's time to go. Um, you know, and scare them. Banging pots is a great thing, you know, uh, throwing things near them so that they get startled is okay. So um, I would say that, but really it's a gift that they're here and they're part of our ecology and um, just, it's, it's a beautiful thing that we're getting to witness and be part of this time in California. Thank you. I know I'm, I'm, um, it's really exciting um, to be in this time of change. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions about our YouTube page and how things are going to be made available. So there will be a follow up email with some links and um, we will, um, it will be posted under the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy um, YouTube page. So if you search Parks Conservancy, um, you will come upon our orange logo. Um, I think it's 15 syllables, 35 letters, uh, seven words, uh, Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, and uh, you will find the recording there within a week. Thanks for asking. All right, so we are right at 8.30, and I think a lot of the questions we have I, are best answered uh, on BearWise and BearSmart.com, and I think through reviewing some of the resources that Kiana so uh, gracefully provided. Thank you. Um, and with that, thank you everybody so much for being here and being part of building bear culture in the North Bay and being part of this very special moment as Marin um, we wilds in this regard. So to all, have a good night, snuggle your teddy bears, um, and all that sweet dreams. <laughs>